Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Division of Marine Fisheries listening session. These sessions are hosted by the division um, as a way for the public to be heard, um, to hear from directly from the division biologists and also to ask us questions. So it's a listening session for the public, but it's also a listening session for the division staff who are working on these issues every day. Uh, today, we're going to be uh, hearing an overview of the information and management options in draft amendment two of the striped mullet fishery management plan. So at their November business meeting, the Marine Fisheries Commission approved the draft agenda, uh, excuse me, the draft amendment um, for public and advisory committee review. Um, the Northern, Southern, and Thin Fish Advisory Committees are going to be reviewing these documents during their January meetings. Those begin on uh, January 9th. And um, more information about those meetings and just general information about the striped mullet stuff can be found um, on the division's website. So uh, we have linked that in the chat. Um, so one of the main reasons that we're here today is so that any member of the public can ask questions directly of our biologists. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, please enter it into the chat at any time during this um, during this whole session. The uh, to open the chat window, if you're not familiar, um, you just look down towards the bottom right hand side of your screen, and you should see the word chat um, towards the bottom. If you just click on that. Um, it should pop open the chat box and you can enter a question at any time during the presentation or during the question and answer period. Um, and also we are going to be putting links to information in there as well. So if you want to follow along, just keep that chat box open during the presentation. Um, once the presentation is uh, complete, I'll be moderating the question and answer period just to make sure that we get in as many questions um, as we can during our time today. Um, you'll see the links uh, for the information um, popping up. So just keep those in mind as you're as you're listening and if you're looking for more information. Um, all right, so now that I've gone over all of that, we can go ahead and get into the presentation. Um, this listening session is being recorded and it will be posted online later today for the members of the public who aren't able to attend um, and so that everybody can hear the questions um, that, that are asked today. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to our biologists and we're gonna have about a half hour of presentation followed by about a half hour of questions. At the end of the presentation, you will see the contact information for our biologists. And we encourage you, if you have any questions that weren't answered during this question and answer session, please feel free to email or call um, the division. We're happy to talk about it more. All right, we'll get started. Good afternoon. My name is Jeff Dobbs, and I'm a biologist out of the Central District Office in Moorhead City. I'm joined here today by Willow Patton, a biologist from our Washington Field Office. Today, we'll be presenting information about Draft Amendment 2 to the Striped Mullet Fishery Management Plan. The Marine Fisheries Commission approved the draft plan to go out for public comment and advisory committee review at their November business meeting. The purpose of this presentation is to provide the public with additional information about draft amendment two. After the presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions about the amendment. We will not be accepting public comment today, but there will be three advisory committee meetings in January where public comment will be accepted. As a reminder, at this point, Amendment 2 is still a draft. Options and recommendations may change based on public comment and advisory committee feedback. We will first go over the goal and objectives of Amendment 2. We will then cover the management unit for this FMP, provide an overview of the striped mullet fisheries in North Carolina, and review results of the 2022 stock assessment. We will then move into an overview of the two issue papers and information paper included in Amendment 2 before reviewing the timeline for implementation and the amendment of the amendment and taking questions. The goal of Amendment 2 is to manage the striped mullet fishery to achieve a self-sustaining population that provides sustainable harvest using science-based decision-making processes. The objectives to meet this goal are one, to sustain and restore the spawning stock. Two, 
to restore, enhance, and protect critical habitat and environmental quality. Three, to monitor and manage fisheries and their environmental impacts. And four, to promote stewardship of the resource. The management unit of this FMP includes all striped mullet inhabiting North Carolina's coastal and inland fishing waters. Tagging studies in North Carolina suggest a residential adult, adult stock since most striped mullet dart tagged in North Carolina have been recovered in state waters with a small marker capture distance. Striped mullet are distributed coastwide in North Carolina and are found in most coastal habitats, including rivers, estuaries, marshes, and the ocean. Mullet begin their lives offshore, eventually moving inshore into estuarine and shallow water habitats to grow out to adulthood. In the fall, mature adult mullet migrate through coastal inlets to offshore spawning grounds during their annual spawning migrations, returning to North Carolina's coastal waters in the spring. So now we will move into an overview of the striped mullet commercial fisheries in North Carolina. In the figure on the left, you can see landings and X vessel value for the commercial striped mullet fishery by year since 1972. Landings and value peaked from the early 1980s to the late 1990s because of strong demand from Europe and Asia for row, creating a highly profitable row fishery. During the peak demand for row, 2.5 to 3 million pounds of mullet were landed in some years. Because the commercial fishery primarily targets striped mullet row, the greatest demand, intensity of harvest, and price per pound occur in October and November, coinciding with the peak spawning period for striped mullet. From the early 2000s to 2020, landings mostly stabilized to around 1 to 1.5 million pounds annually, except for 2016, when landings dipped to just under 1 million pounds. Since 2020, landings in the commercial fishery have increased substantially from about 1.3 million pounds landed in 2021 or 2020 to 2.1 million pounds landed in 2021. In the figure on the right, you can see the number of trips landing striped mullet and participants in the striped mullet commercial fishery by year. While the number of participants in the fishery has been relatively stable in recent years, the number of trips landing striped mullet has increased substantially since 2019. This indicates that effort in this fishery has increased over the past few years, resulting in one of the greatest annual landings in the time series in 2021. Commercial landings are not a good indicator of abundance because they are impacted by changes in the market, demand, fishing effort, and the weather. But what this does show is that fishery removals are increasing on an already overfished stock. It is important to remember that Amendment 2 uh, management must be based on the results of the 2022 stock assessment, which only includes data through 2019. We can look at individual pieces of data from the years since 2019, but we cannot use them to determine the status of the stock. To know how stock status has changed since 2019, we would need an updated stock assessment. In this figure, you can see commercial striped mullet landings by the dominant gear types in the fishery from 1972 to 2021. The heights of the stacked bar bars represent total pounds of mullet landed by all gear types for this year. You can see that this figure is very similar to the figure on the previous slide showing total landings by year. Each color represents a different gear and the amount of landings contributed by each of those gears in that year. Beach seines and gillnets have been the two primary gear types used in the striped mullet commercial fishery. The beach seine fishery accounted for most commercial harvest from 1972 to 1978. You can see beach seine landings in the figure as the dark blue bars. Gillnet landings are shown here as the light blue and green bars. Gillnets replaced beach seines as the dominant gear type in the fishery in 1979, and the annual proportion of total landings harvested by gillnets steadily increased until 1995. You can see how the proportion of light blue and green has increased over the years, while the dark blue bars have gotten much smaller as beach seine landings have decreased. Since 1995, gillnet landings have averaged around 91% of annual striped mullet landings. Runaround gillnet landings of striped mullet exceed those of any other gear. The red asterisks represent confident, 
confidential landings from the beach sand fishery. The commercial striped mullet fishery in North Carolina is highly seasonal and primarily targets spawning female mullet for their row during their annual spawning migration. This figure shows average commercial mullet harvest by month for 2017 to 2021. As you can see, most mullet are landed in October and November while they are moving into the ocean to spawn. The recreational fishery for mullet is primarily a cast net fishery that targets juvenile white and striped mullet for use as bait. Larger striped mullet are also caught and used as cut bait, and some are used as food. Since mullet are rarely encountered during creel surveys, there is a lack of data for recreational striped mullet landings. A cast net study completed by the division in the early 2000s determined that most mullet harvested recreationally using cast nets are likely white mullet. The figure on the left shows the proportion of striped and white mullet harvested in DMF cast net samples from June to November. You can see that before November, most mullet harvested in cast nets are white mullet, while in November, most are striped mullet. This estimated that 29% of all mullet harvested in cast nets are likely striped mullet. The table on the right shows the number of anglers interviewed by MRIP who harvested different amounts of mullets. Even though mullets are rarely observed during MRIP creel surveys as they are usually released or used prior to the end of the trip, anglers are still asked to provide the number of any fish they caught and released or used as bait, including mullet. Amongst anglers who reported landings, landing mullet, MRIP data suggests about 85% harvested 1 to 25 mullet during their fishing trips, and about 97% harvested 1 to 50 mullet during their fishing trips. This figure shows recreational striped mullet estimates in numbers from MRIP data for 2002 to 2021. Harvest declined from 2002 and 2003 before stabilizing from 2004 to 2017. Harvest declined again from 2018 to 2020 to around 500,000 fish, the lowest values in the time series, before increasing again in 2021. Recreational striped mullet harvest accounted for 1.7% of total harvest in 2019 by weight and 4.2% of total harvest by weight from 1994 to 2019. The division completed a benchmark stock assessment of the striped mullet stock in 2022. The terminal year of the assessment, which was the last year of the data that was included, was 2019. If the stock is undergoing overfishing, it means that fishing is causing a level of mortality that prevents the fishery from producing a sustainable harvest. If the stock is overfished, it means that the spawning stock biomass of the fishery is below the level that is adequate for the recruitment class of the fishery to replace the spawning class of the fishery. The figure on the left shows spawning stock biomass. As you can see, spawning stock biomass has been below the threshold shown by the solid black line since the early 2000s. The figure on the right shows fishing mortality. Fishing mortality has been above the threshold, also shown by the solid black line, since 2012, indicating overfishing is occurring. Based on statutory requirements and the status of the stock, management options are presented in Amendment 2 to end overfishing within two years and obtain sustainable harvest within 10 years with at least 50% probability of success. Stock projections indicate a conservative 21.3 to 35.4% reduction in total removals is needed to rebuild the spawning stock biomass to a sustainable level. Now we'll move into an overview of the components of draft amendment two. The amendment contains two issue papers that discuss management options for the commercial and recreational striped mullet fisheries to achieve sustainable harvest and one information paper that characterizes the small mesh gillnet fishery for striped mullet in North Carolina. The information paper is used to inform the sustainable harvest issue paper because small mesh gillnets are the primary gear used to harvest striped mullet in North Carolina. The draft amendment is structured so that each paper is an appendix to the FMP for ease of reference. 
Now we will walk through an overview of each appendix. First, we will discuss Appendix 1, which is the Small Mesh Gillnet Characterization Information Paper. At their August 2021 business meeting, the MSC passed a motion to not initiate rulemaking on small mesh gillnets, but refer the issue through the FMP process for each species and for any issues or rules coming out of the species-specific FMP to be addressed at that time. In North Carolina, small mesh gillnets are the predominant gear used to harvest striped mullet. Most striped mullet are harvested commercially using runaround or other actively fished gillnets, and striped mullet harvested incidentally in set small mesh gillnets are rarely discarded unless they are unmarketable. Most other species harvested incidentally in target striped mullet fisheries are marketable as well. In the figure on the right, you can see that particularly during the fall, striped mullet constitutes a high percentage of the harvest from runaround gillnets. Per direction from the MFC, small mesh gillnets must be addressed during review of the striped mullet FMP. Appendix 1 characterizes the small mesh gillnet fishery for striped mullet in North Carolina and discusses greater flexibility with constraining harvest, reducing bycatch, and to the greatest extent possible, reducing conflict between gillnet users and other stakeholders. The information paper presents information to inform potential management measures discussed in the Sustainable Harvest Issue Paper. This includes how mesh size restrictions, regional management, trip limits, and yardage restrictions could be expected to impact striped mullet harvest. The paper also presents information about how management options for small mesh gillnets used to manage the striped mullet fishery may impact other small mesh gillnet fisheries. It also addresses the topic of bycatch in the striped mullet commercial small mesh gillnet fishery and discusses other small mesh gillnet fisheries that harvest striped mullet incidentally. Thank you, Jeff. Appendix 2 is a sustainable harvest issue paper. This figure, which can be found in Appendix 2 on page 57 of Draft Amendment 2, shows estimated recruitment levels for North Carolina striped mullet stock from 1990 to 2019. In this figure, the orange line shows average recruitment for the time series. The purple line shows average high recruitment that occurred from 1990 to 2004. The blue line shows average low recruitment that has occurred since 2008. Recruitment in North Carolina striped mullet stock has generally declined since highs in the 90s and early 2000s and has been lower than the average for over 10 years. Recruitment and recent trends in recruitment are important because stock projections and recovery are highly dependent on recruitment assumptions. Recovery timelines and probabilities of success were projected for both low and average recruitment scenarios to ensure that calculated reductions would meet statutory requirements to rebuild the stock within 10 years, with at least a 50% probability of success. These recruitment scenarios were chosen because they represent recent trends in recruitment. This table, which can be found in Appendix 2 on page 57, shows number of years and probability of reaching the target or threshold at different reduction levels with different recruitment assumptions. A 21.3% to 35.4% reduction in removals is projected to, at minimum, bring spawning stock biomass, or SSB, to the threshold within 10 years, even with low recruitment. A 21.3% reduction is projected to bring SSB to the threshold in seven years with low recruitment and two years with average recruitment. A 35.4% reduction is projected to bring SSB to the threshold in three years with low recruitment and in two years with average recruitment. If low recruitment occurs, SSB is never projected to reach the target, regardless of harvest reduction level. Managing to bring SSB to the target rather than the threshold increases the probability that management from MIT2 will be effective in rebuilding the stock. Variable and unexpected conditions, including changes in fishing behavior or environmental conditions, can result in selected management measures not being as effective as projected. The specific management measures discussed in Amendment 2 are both quantifiable and projected to meet the required stripe mullet harvest reductions based on 2019, the terminal year of the stock assessment. All options presented achieve sustainable harvest within 10 years with at least a 50% probability of success. 
The North Carolina Fisheries Reform Act requires management measures to be implemented to address the overfish and overfishing status on the stock status as determined by the peer reviewed stock assessment. The options discussed in this paper were defined based on input from the MFC and feedback received from the Stripe Mullet FMP Advisory Committee during their summer workshop. The management measures being considered in this paper include size limits, season closures, trip limits, day of week closures, combinations of measures, stop net management, seasonal cash limits, or quotas, area, area closures, limited entry, and adaptive management. Initial DMF recommendations are indicated in this paper, but those recommendations are subject to change based on the feedback we received from the public and MFC standing advisory committees. A framework for adaptive management of the striped mullet stock is also discussed in Appendix 2. Adaptive management provides flexibility to incorporate new information and accommodate alternative or additional actions. Stock assessments can be used to determine if management targets are being met and should continue to be used to inform management of the striped mullet stock. The adaptive management framework presented in the paper would allow the director to use proclamation authority to adjust season closures, day of week closures, trip limits, and gill net yardage or mesh restrictions to help ensure management targets are being met based on results of the stock assessment updates. Use of the director's proclamation authority for adaptive management would be contingent on consultation with the MFC advisory committees and approval by the Marine Fisheries Commission. Approving this adaptive management framework allows the division to respond more quickly to changes in stock conditions as indicated by stock assessment updates between full reviews of the FMP. In a situation where the stock is determined to have recovered based on the results of a stock assessment update, guardrail management could be considered as part of the adaptive management framework recommended by the division. Guardrail management would be management implemented once the stock has recovered to prevent the stock from becoming overfished and undergoing overfishing again in the future. An industry work group would be formed to assist the division in developing management options to maintain spawning stock biomass and fishing mortality at or above targets. The public and standing advisory committees would provide input and adoption of these measures would be contingent upon MFC approval. Because current stock status was determined by a peer reviewed stock assessment, only a stock assessment can be used to determine if the stock has recovered. Upon stock recovery, data sources can be evaluated to inform development of management triggers and appropriate reference points that could be used to inform management between stock assessments. This slide shows Table 2.18 and Appendix 2 summarizing the sustainable harvest management options. These options are presented in more detail in Appendix 2. There are options for minimum and maximum size limits, seasonal size limits, season closures, including regional closures, trip limits, day of week closures, and combinations of options such as pairing trip limits with other restrictions, options for management specific to the stop net fishery, seasonal catch limit options, area closures, limited entry, and adaptive management. These options are listed on pages four through nine in the decision document. Now we will switch to discussing Appendix 3, which is the characterization and management of the North Carolina Recreational Mullet Fishery Issue Paper. Appendix 3 characterizes and explores potential non-quantifiable management options to support in support of sustainable harvest objectives. Because of uncertainty in recreational harvest estimates, it is not possible to calculate harvest reductions from any specific management measure. Regardless of recreational fishery magnitude or importance, implementing management on the commercial fishery without limiting recreational harvest could shift effort and have the potential to complicate enforcement. Whether recreational harvest reductions are quantifiable or not, sustainability objectives should be consistent between commercial and recreational fisheries management. In this appendix, the available data was used to guide management options that would allow for traditional use of the resource while supporting sustainability objectives. The options considered in this paper include individual bag limits, size based and seasonal bag limits, vessel limits, bag and vessel limits for prior fishing operations, and adaptive management. The current mullet rule allows a 200 fish per person per day recreational bag limit. However, given the current status of the stock, such a high bag limit is no longer appropriate. 
the bag limit reduction options presented in Appendix 3 would likely be sufficient for most recreational users while allowing for traditional use of the fishery and ensuring management of the recreational fishery is consistent with the sustainability objectives of Amendment 2. This slide show, shows Table 3.7 and Appendix 3 summarizing the recreational fishery management options. These options are presented in more detail in Appendix 3. Management options include recreational bag limits, seasonal and size-based bag limits, and options to manage for higher vessel operations. Initial DMF recommended options were refined using input from the Stripe Mullet FMP Advisory Committee. In developing these recommendations, the, the division aimed to allow for traditional use of the fishery while achieving necessary harvest reductions to rebuild the stock. These recommendations were included in draft amendment two so that the public and standing advisory committees could provide their input and are subject to change based on input received. One thing we heard from the Stripe Mullet Advisory Committee was that they preferred options that do not result in any total harvest closures. Committee members were concerned a total closure would result in effort shifts or a derby fishery before the closure and could result in Stripe Mullet dead discards and other fisheries. To address these concerns, the initial division recommendation is a year-round 50-pound trip limit on Saturdays and Sundays and a 50-pound trip limit for all of January and from October. November 16th to December 31st. Fishing operations will likely not target striped mullet while there is a 50 pound trip limit, but the low limit allows incidentally caught mullet to be harvested. Implementing the weekend trip limit preferentially benefits full-time commercial participants while limiting user group conflict. A 50 pound trip limit from November 16th to December 31 limits harvest well, allowing for the targeted and most profitable component of the mullet fishery to continue. The division also recommends a 500 pound trip limit from February 1st to October 15th. Most trips that harvest mullet before the row season harvest less than 500 pounds. This trip, this trip limit should not adversely impact most commercial operations while preventing excessive early season harvest. The division also recommends a 30,000 pound catch cap for the stop net fishery. Recently, the stop net fishery has accounted for around 2% of striped mullet commercial harvest. A 30,000 pound catch cap allows the fishery to continue landing around 2% of the total harvest while achieving the necessary harvest reductions. Without a catch limit specifically allocated to the stop net fishery, other management options in this plan may effectively exclude this fishery. In combination, these measures are projected to achieve a 35.5% reduction compared to commercial landings from 2019. Even if low recruitment occurs, this level of reduction is projected, projected to reach SSB threshold with 99% probability of success and assuming average recruitment reaches the SSB target with 100% probability of success. Because the initial recommendations do not rely on a hard landings cap, that would be achieved by options like a quota, managing to the target increases the probability of stock rebuilding, even if there is variability in fishing effort, market demand, stripe mullet availability to the fishery or recruitment fluctuations. For the recreational fishery, the division is recommending an individual bag limit of 50 fish per person per day. The available recreational data suggests more, most anglers harvest 50 or fewer mullet per trip. A 50 fish bag limit prevents excessive recreational harvest and should be sufficient for most recreational participants. The division also recommends that for higher vessel operations be allowed to possess a bag limit for the number of anglers they are licensed to carry, including advance of a trip. This would allow traditional use of this fishery and the for hire industry while limiting recreational harvest. The division also recommends the adaptive management framework presented in Appendix 3 be adopted. This framework allows the division to respond to stock assessments, stock assessment results in a timelier manner and adjust management measures to ensure sustainability. Other options presented in the plan, such as size limits, season closures, area closures, and seasonal catch limits were not supported by the FMPAC and are not recommended by the division. The FMPAC was not supportive of size limits because they would need to be implemented with corresponding gillnet mesh size restrictions, 
which could adversely impact other gillnet fisheries. A maximum size limit would exclude the largest, most profitable fish in the row fishery. A minimum size limit would exclude the, the bait mullet fishery and would likely only delay harvest until the fish reach harvestable size, potentially causing necessary reductions to not be realized. Size limits could also result in more dis dev discards of mullet and a high volume component of a commercial mullet fishery, or a fisherman needing to catch more smaller mullet to make up for the lost revenue from not being able to harvest the more valuable larger mullet. Seasonal catch limits were not recommended because they require a lot of resources to implement and other management options are available that have not yet been used with mullet. The FMPAC did not support seasonal catch limits because the limit would be based on 2019 landings and a complete closure would be necessary once the limit is harvested, severely restricting the row fishery if the limit is harvested earlier in the year. The AC was also concerned that a seasonal catch limit could result in a derby fishery. Area closures were not recommended because harvest reductions cannot be quantified and they would impact other gillnet fisheries and harvest would likely be recouped once the mullet moved into open areas, possibly resulting in reductions not being realized. Limited entry was not recommended because it, it is not an appropriate management option unless the MFC determines sustainable harvest cannot be otherwise achieved. The public comment period began on December 18th and will end on January 17th, 2024. The Northern, Southern, and FinFish Advisory Committees will have a chance to review and discuss the draft amendment at their January meetings, where public comment will also be accepted. The division will consider input from the public and advisory committees and may make changes to the plan or initial recommendations based on the input received. The next step is for the Marine Fisheries Commission to select their preferred management options at their February 2024 business meeting. Once the MFC selects the preferred management options, the plan will be sent for Department of Environmental Quality, Secretary, and Legislative Review. The final step will be for the MFC to vote on final adoption of the FMP scheduled for their May business meeting. Once the MFC has voted to adopt the plan, Amendment 2 management will be implemented for the striped mullet fishery. This means that if all remaining steps are completed without delay, Amendment 2 management would go into effect beginning in May of 2024. As a reminder, public comment is accepted at all MFC business meetings. There are three ways that you can submit public comment for Amendment 2. You can attend the advisory committee meetings in January, fill out an online form, or submit your comments by mail. You can find information about how to submit public comments on our website or social media pages. If you need help submitting public comment, you can also contact one of the species leads. And with that, we'll take any questions. Thank you, Willow and Jeff. So now I see that we have some questions in the chat. Um, I will um, just so everyone knows who's listening, I will put their contact information back up on the screen once we're done with the question and answer session. Um, but now let's get to these questions. So, Jeff and Willow, are you guys ready? Yes. Awesome. All right. So, let's see, I'm going to scroll up here to this top. Let's see, it looks like we had some audio issues that we had help with. So thank you to those of you who are helping out with that. And hopefully everyone was able to hear. Um, so Ted James asked, um, he said, I'm curious if the landings data for mullets are going to be finally separated by species and if fisheries has any idea of how many silver mullet are in their catch data for the last two decade, decades. So I'll hand that to you, Jeff. Yeah, okay. Um... During the presentation, first we discussed the recreational landings, and part of MRIP survey is if they see the fish, then we can um, we can record it by species. But when anglers are reporting their catch, um, that part we're still going to be at the genus level. So that's going to be a mix of the white and striped mullets. Um, in the commercial catch, you know we have fish house uh, representatives that go out and measure fish um, as the catches come in. And that the information we've got from there shows that um, there's 
rarely ever any white mullet mixed in with the striped mullet in commercial catches. The exception to that being the cast net fishery where you're going to have those smaller bait fish. There is some um, white mullet mixed in there, but that's going to be a, a pretty insignificant amount. I um, hope that answers the question. So, <clears throat> excuse me. All right. Do we have any other questions? I'll just pause for a little bit. Just as a reminder, if you want to ask a question, you can just type it into the chat. The chat box is at the bottom right hand corner. So you can just click there, open it up and then type in a message and that'll come to everybody. I just wanted to add that one of our research recommendations is also to look more closely at the species composition of cast net catches. Great, thank you. All right. So we have a comment from Rick. So Jeff and Willow, are you able to see those comments? Yes, we can see it. And he's asking about um, discard of fish um, in the commercial fishery. I don't know if you, I'm, I'm not aware of this, so I don't know if you guys have any comment on this specifically. Um, what I will say is that during our, uh, our workshop, advisory committee workshop, we did meet with commercial fishermen and we discussed options. And part of the reason we didn't go with full close, day closures for a recommendation on the weekends. I mean, also during the close season, it had a, a, just a small trip limit as opposed to a full closure. Is That's to allow um, there to not be any discards. We've, we looked at the amount of catch on average when striped mullet weren't being targeted. And we tried to incorporate that into our trip limit for those days that would have been closed. And what that does is allow the fishermen to keep the incidentally caught striped mullet um, while still not having a large impact on total catch. Great, thank you. All right, so Joanne had a question. She said, how do you expect fishermen to limit a catch to a thousand odd when setting a net? Now, I don't know what a thousand odd is, but hopefully you guys are familiar. Um, well, we could implement um, gill net yardage restrictions oh. that would help limit discards. So that would help so, control um, how much people are catching. I apologize, Joanne. I see you've popped up. It's a thousand pounds when setting a net. Thank you, Willow. All right, Ken Siegler had a question for us. It's mesh size used in every commercial fishery to mitigate harvest. Why not minimum mesh size for mullet fishery? And I think you touched on this a little bit in your presentation, um, and it's related to sort of because the mullet fishery is for bait fish and for those roe mullet. If if you limit one, it's sort of a struggle to not limit the other one. Is that accurate? That's part of it. And also, if we put in mesh size restrictions, it's going to have consequences on other fisheries. Um, Basically, striped mullet are incidentally caught in almost every small mesh fishery that we have in North Carolina. So, by enacting a minimum or a maximum size or mesh size limit for the gill nets, then we're going to have consequences on these other fisheries. So, if we can achieve that without affecting other fisheries, that would be the goal. Thanks, Jeff. All right. So, Justin Nowak uh, asked, in what ways are recreational harvests obtained? I have never seen or been asked for the amount of mullet that I've harvested per trip or given uh, or within a given time frame. So, um, our recreational port agents ask people as they land at the dock what they harvested, and that would include any mullet that they harvested for bait. Um, our mail survey also gets effort estimates for people targeting mullet with cast nets. And so, just just to clarify, so I think he's asking. It sounds like Justin is a fisherman and he has not been asked when we do those recreational surveys since they're surveys. Does that mean that every fisherman should get asked or is that sort of a smaller number? 
So we intercept as many fishermen as we can at the dock, um, but we use those to generate estimates. So not everybody gets asked, but we get enough that we can estimate. Part of it. Okay, so you sort of get a, you get some people, but maybe not everybody. Thank you, Whitlow. All right, so Bill Gorham had a question. He said, looking at the stock assessment, it appears that mullet and recruitment from outside independent sampling with North Carolina wasn't included in uh, or was weighted differently than in prior stock assessments. And what percent of mullets sold in North Carolina are imported? Oh, I'm sorry. He said, okay, <laughs> I think I've caught up with Mr. Gorham. Um, so it sounds like he's asking a question about data that was included or was weighted differently in the stock assessment. I don't know, is that a question you guys can answer? I know we have our stock assessment scientists who are more in that realm, but do you guys have any insight for us? So I think the question might be that about uh, which independent sampling was used. And so it was a different suite of independent sampling. We we just used 915, granted a broader portion of the 915 sampling, which is our independent gillnet survey. And we did exclude the electrofishing survey because it was really redundant to the uh, the gillnet fishing, uh, the, the gillnet survey. Um, in terms of weighting, um, I'm not sure in particular what weighting we were discussing, um, but there there was just some uh, model optimization that was done in order to to get better results without getting too in depth. I think I think that is a question for our stock assessment uh, scientists, maybe who are not on this meeting, but certainly are available um, if anyone has those specific questions, either at one of our commission meetings um, or, uh, of course, anytime you want to call the division, um, we're available uh, nine to five during the week. <laughs> um, so let's see what else we have. Um, Mr. Fletcher asked, how did water quality from Camp Lejeune affect reproduction of mullet according to DEQ. Do we have any information about that specific question? Um, we don't have information about that, but one of our research recommendations was to look at how environmental factors like water quality can impact the stock. And we also discussed some water quality issues in the plan that could be impacting striped mullet in North Carolina, mm -hmm. but we don't have information specifically about military bases. Okay. It seems like in all of our FMPs, water quality is sort of one of those topics that sort of spans everything because uh, it affects all of our species. Um, let's see. What else do we have? Let's see. We have a follow up from Rick. I'm going to let you guys read that one. Um, He's talking about a video that showed some uh, bycatch in the commercial operations and. Um, I think you've already answered that 1. Yeah, so I, I, think I, will say I, I did see the videos and um, there is going to be some calling in, in any fishery, whether these were damaged fish. Um, or, yeah, I don't, I don't know what was going on there. Um, but there, there is going to be some amount of culling and there is going to be some unmarketable discards um, from any fishery. Now, I do know that the market was supporting the, the fishery this year pretty well, so there wouldn't be any reason to discard uh, the males, which I think was an issue that I saw raised online. Um, I know that everyone that I spoke to, uh, commercial fisherman-wise and dealer-wise, they were accepting the uh, the males as well, and and so there wouldn't be a reason to discard them unless they were damaged or unmarketable in some other way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Corinne provided some information about water quality um, as well. The Coastal Habitat Protection Plan, of course, is where the state, um, along with our other partner agencies, work on water quality issues. 
So I just want to go back. Uh, Joanne asked, why did you exclude the shock survey? I think this is going back to the stock assessment. Um, again, I know you guys aren't the stock assessment scientists. I don't know if you have um, a response for that one or if we would need to talk to the stock assessment group. Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, so basically, the electroshocking survey has a very uh, limited spatial coverage, but it also overlaps with our independent gillnet survey. They had similar results, um, but they weren't tracking perfectly. So what it did was it decreased the the uh, model's um, ability to to estimate the cat or estimate the abundance. Has that shocking survey been expanded? Yeah, that's a great point. It, it sure has. In response to us not using this survey, um, you know, we decided to take a look at it. And we we said, you know, if this isn't being used, how can we change this? So what we did is we expanded it to more areas and uh, used more of a, a random stratified sampling um, regime rather than just fixed stations, so that we can try to capture what's going on in a broader area. So is that is the point of that to maybe use it in a, another stock assessment to compare those to compare those you know data but with the Gilnet survey once, once we get a suitable time series for the new uh, program which you know usually five to ten years is what you're looking for and I know that doesn't help us immediately but um, you know in the next cycle or the cycle after that we'll be able to include this data and hopefully get a better snapshot of the fishery when we run these stock assessments. Thank you. All right, uh, James Fletcher asked about how many mullets sold in North Carolina are imported. I don't know if we have that information. That might be a Department of Agriculture question maybe or <laughs> I don't know if you have any of that information. I think he probably meant exported because um, that is a significant portion of our catch. Mm -hmm. but we are not, uh, most of our dealers within the state are not the end seller. So what would happen is our dealers would sell to a cutter or a larger operation in Florida or Louisiana typically. And then those folks would distribute to export markets. So we don't have a firm handle on, on, uh, what those numbers are, but we do know that the majority of our row mullet are exported to other states. Thank you, Jeff. All right, so I'm just looking to see if we have any other questions. And so since uh, I'll just give it another minute, but um, just for everybody's information, um, this is the ACE, this is the uh, public comment period for this plan. So can you just let people know what happens after um, we have comment from the public and also the advisory committee meetings? Um, the MSC will have access to those comments and um, before their next meeting so they can consider it. And we'll also consider comments. Um, this is still just a draft of the plan, so we could change our recommendations. We'll consider those comments as well when reviewing the plan. Thank you, Willow. So I just want to say uh, Mr. Fletcher did specify he wanted to know if they were imported from other countries. Um, I don't think we have that information about mullet imported. Yeah, I think that would be a different agency. All right, uh, Mr. Gorham has, if the majority of recreational anglers surveyed have 50 fish, what database justification is there to reduce the bag limit from excessive 200 to 50? I may have missed the data. Um, well, we, we think sustainability objectives should be consistent between the commercial and recreational sector. Um, putting in a 50 fish bag limit just limits um, recreational harvest. So that would be sufficient for most anglers without a few that might excessively harvest recreationally. Mm -hmm. 
I think also um, this speaks to the survey method of recreational data collection. Um, these are again estimates, so it's sort of trying to keep this fishery sustainable, but not to have excessive limits on it. We also wouldn't um, want effort to increase in the recreational fishery when we limit commercial harvest for bait. So if there's less bait available in the commercial fishery, we could see effort shift into the recreational. Yeah. Thank you for that. All right, Joanne wanted to know when is the next stock assessment? So the earliest possible stock assessment would be when we have the complete 2024 data. Um, so we could possibly look into trying to um, run the assessment again. We would use the same model constraints um, as we did in the prior one. So this wouldn't be this would be a stock assessment update and not a new stock assessment. So hopefully, uh, I would think mid 2025 would be the earliest. But we'd have to consult with our Stock assessment scientists. Thank you. All right. This says, uh, Mr. Fletcher asks, would net pen aquaculture be allowed by North Carolina Marine Fisheries? So I guess that would be the Marine Fisheries Commission or the Division of Marine Fisheries. <laughs> and since we can't speak for the commission, we'll have to speak for um, at least what the potential is for that. I don't know if that's even come up for striped mullet. Yeah, I don't think that's something we've considered. <laughs> um, yep, I don't think that's something that we've discussed, um, mostly because we haven't heard anyone from the industry um, bring that forward. But that is something that that is, we should look into because that is a, a, a burgeoning fishery in other parts of the world. Oh, that's really interesting. All right. And just so everybody knows, we did have a question about whether the presentation in question would be shared. Um, we will be sharing, we'll be posting this um, listening session online, the recording of it, along with the question and answer period. So um, if anybody hasn't had a chance to um, hear, you will be able to watch the recording online. All right, and we had a question. Let's see, uh, Justin Nowak asked, um, would it be possible to implement a more inclusive survey for recreational harvest for any fish via email sent to all license holders? I think we would need to defer to the license and statistics folks on this one. Um, how, do you have any sense of, uh, so the MRIP data collection, it collects data um, better for some species than others. How good is the data that comes in from the striped mullet fishery in terms of how reliable is it um, for the estimates? Do you have any sense of that? Not to speak about MRIP itself, but just in terms of um, how many samples are collected and things like that. Um, the recreational data for shrimp mullet from MRIP isn't very precise because that survey targets hook and line fishing. Um, but we do have a male survey for effort. Mm -hmm. So that gets more at the bait use aspect of it. Great. So uh, David Sneed asked if we could repeat the reductions that are needed to meet the target versus the threshold and the time for achieving. Um, I'm gonna, David, I'm gonna refer you to the um, presentation, but if you don't mind, just really quick, um, just stating again what the reductions are. It's a 21.3 to 35.4% reduction. Um. Thank you. All right, and Rick asked, is there any data that shows the breakdown of recreational harvest for live finger mullet bait between white mullet and striped mullet? And you did go over the um, cast net survey that was done. Maybe just refresh us on that. Yeah, so that cast net survey was done in the early 2000s, and it showed that about 29% of 
of mullet tossed by cut by cast net for bait are striped mullet. So the majority are white mullet. Um, one of our research recommendations is to repeat that study um, just to have a better idea of species composition of cast net and recreational harvest. So that's something that we do agree um, we want to understand better. Thank you, Willow. All right, we've got about five minutes left. Anybody has any final questions they'd like to ask? Okay, I'm not seeing anything coming through, so I'll just um, I'll just go ahead and start to wrap us up. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming today. Um, we have, uh, like I said, this presentation and the questions will be on the website. Um, so look out for that. Um, it looks like we've had a couple of questions come in. Let's see if we can get to those before the end of our time. Let's see. Uh, uh, Ken Siegler asked a minimum mesh size two inch row. Um, he's asking, so if you'll just look at that, he's asking about uh, why we can't have a two inch minimum mesh size. Well, uh, one, of the, one of the issues with that is that it's the larger fish that are more valuable. So if we decrease that mesh size, the fishermen may need to catch more of the smaller fish to make up for the revenue. So we could have, you know, more fish being harvested. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like the mesh size is just not the best approach um, so far that there are other methods that we can use. That's right. And we, we did consider mesh size, but like I said, at our uh, workshop with the advisory committee, um, folks from the commercial side told us that that, that really wasn't the best approach. And uh, after investigating it, we, we came to a similar conclusion. Okay. Thank you. All right. So Chris asked, um, how how are we man? So he's asking how about we manage for sustainability instead of maximum extraction. So, um, let's see. So I just want to pull this down. Yeah. So I will say that the objective here is for uh, sustainability and not necessarily maximum extraction. That's why the division's recommendation is to the target, the 35% end, rather than for the bare minimum. We're looking to recover this stock as quickly as possible so that we can have continued harvest in the future. All right. These, these recommendations are to achieve sustainable harvest within 10 years of the plan being adopted. Thank you, Willow. All right, and so the uh, Ken Siegler is asking about losses in the southern area. So I know that the um, there was a lot of discussion about the closures in the northern versus southern area. Um, I don't know if you have any any additional information about that for Mr. Siegler's question. So the division's initial recommendations don't include any hard closures. Um, so once the amendment is adopted, it's possible we won't have a closure um, in the south like that with the supplement. But the supplement will be in effect until this amendment is approved and adopted. Thank you, Willow. All right. So we've got two minutes. I'm going to go ahead and wrap us up. I just want to thank everybody again for coming and asking questions. And I will share my screen again with the contact information for our biologists here um, for Jeff and Willow. If you have additional questions that you'd like to ask them, if you'd like to speak to them um, and get more of a complete answer for your question, please feel free to reach out. Um, we're available here and we'll be taking public comment um, as they described in the presentation um, through the middle of January. Um, feel free to come out and let us know what you think, and we'll talk to you later. So thank you, everybody.